Today in AC Electrical Circuits, we're going to be taking a look at lab number 10, Series Resonance. Under the objective, it says this exercise investigates the voltage relationships in a series resonance circuit. Of primary importance are the establishment of the resonant frequency and the quality factor, or Q, of the circuit with relation to the values of R, L, and C components. Under reference sections, we're referring to Shom's outlines, Basic Electricity, 2nd edition. We're looking at Chapter 21, Series and Parallel Resonance, specifically Series Resonance. So under Chapter 21, uh, we can see it says series and parallel resonance and it says one of the most important characteristics of an RLC circuit is that it can be made to respond most effectively to a single given frequency. When operated in this condition the circuit is said to be in resonance with or resonant to the operating frequency. A circuit operated to provide frequency selectivity is called a tuned circuit. Tuned circuits are used in impedance matching, bandpass filters, and oscillators. So under series resonance, you can see XL is equal to XC, and they give us the formula for figuring out what the resonant frequency is going to be and that's equal to 0.159 divided by the square root of L times C. And in figure 21-1 we have the schematic diagram of a series RLC circuit and you can see at resonance when we select the resonant frequency XL is going to be equal to XC and the two are basically going to cancel out the effects of each other so all you're going to be left with is a resistive circuit. Now down here on figure 21-2 they give you characteristics of a series RL series circuit at resonance. So you can see from our impedance versus frequency chart here when we hit resonant frequency, Z is equal to R, so we're only seeing the resistive part of the circuit. And when the frequency is less, then the capacitive reactance is higher. And when the frequency is higher, then the inductive reactance is going to be higher. When we're looking at the Q of the circuit, and the Q is directly related to the resistance of the circuit, we can see a low Q circuit versus a high Q circuit. Your textbook discusses bandwidth and power of resonant circuits. The width of the resonant band of frequencies centered around FR is called the bandwidth of the tuned circuit. And they show you a diagram, figure 21-9A, that says the group of frequencies with a response equal to 70.7% or more of maximum is considered the bandwidth of a tuned circuit. So for series resonance circuits, the bandwidth is measured between the two edge frequencies, F1 and F2, producing 70.7% .7 of the maximum current at FR. So here in figure 21-9 we can see the bandwidth of a tuned LC circuit and you can see that for series resonance we're looking at current as a percentage of the total current at resonance and when we're at 70.7 .7 of maximum on either side those are considered your two edge frequencies. So F1 is the lower edge, 
and F2 is the upper edge. And the book goes into Q of a series circuit and gives us a formula that Q is equal to XL over R. And remember, XL is going to be equal to XC at resonant frequency. Now you should note here that the lower the reactance, the higher the value of Q. The higher the Q, the sharper, more selective is the resonant curve. And you'll notice Q has the same value if calculated with XC instead of XL, since they are equal at resonance. I'm going to leave you to read through the theory overview. I just want to remind you that it says at some frequency, which is the resonant frequency, the capacitive and inductive reactances will be of the same magnitude. And as they are 180 degrees in opposition, they effectively nullify each other. This leaves the circuit purely resistive, the source seeing only the resistive element. So the current that goes through the resistor will still be the same current that goes through XC and XL, so we should see huge voltage drops across them at resonant frequency. Now it says here, at resonance, the resistor value sets the maximum current and consequently has a major effect on the voltages developed across the capacitor and inductor, as well as the tightness of the voltage versus frequency curve. The smaller the resistance, the tighter the curve, and the higher the voltage seen across the capacitor and inductor. So we're going to be watching for that when we do the lab today. Under equipment, the AC function generator will be the uh, circuit test, SWF 7000. Don't bother with the serial number. The oscilloscope I'm going to use is the TDS 1002. Don't bother with its serial number. Digital multimeter for checking my components will be the Mastec MSM 9803. Don't bother with its serial number. So checking my components that I'm going to be using today, you can see my 10 nanofarad was actually 13.45 nanofarads. My 10 millihenry inductor has a DC coil resistance of 22.3 ohms. My 47 ohm resistor measured 45.6 ohms. And my 470 ohm resistor measured 463 ohms. Now looking at my schematic for today, you can see I have a function generator which has an internal resistance of 50 ohms. I'm going to be hooking that up to my 10 nanofarad capacitor and my 10 millihenry inductor. Now keep in mind my 10 millihenry inductor has a DC coil resistance of 22 ohms and then I'm going to hook it up to a 470 ohm resistor. Now keep in mind that at resonance, the capacitive reactants and the inductive reactants are going to cancel each other out, leaving a purely resistive circuit. So 470 ohms compared to 50 ohms really isn't much larger, but it shouldn't be a problem. But when I do the high Q circuit, and my resistor value is only 47 ohms, and I compare it to 50 ohms, we're going to see that the voltage is going to be dropped across the internal resistance of the uh, function generator. So as we change our frequencies to do our table, we're going to have to be very careful when we reach resonance to make sure that the output voltage stays constant and in this case we want it constant at about one volt peak to peak. So we're going to start with the low Q circuit. So under procedure, step number one, it says using figure 10.1 with R equal to 470 ohms, L is 10 millihenries and C is 10 nanofarads, we're to determine the theoretical resonant frequency in Q and to record the results in table 
Then based on these values, determine the upper and lower frequencies defining the bandwidth of F1 and F2 and record them in table 10.1. It says to be sure to include the 50 ohm source resistance and coil resistances in the calculations. So I've put together a calculation page for you. So the first section is for the low Q circuit where R is 470 ohms, C is 10 nanofarads, L is 10 millihenries. We'll assume everybody's R coil is going to be 22 ohms, and the applied voltage is going to be 1 volt peak to peak. So the first thing we need to know is the resonant frequency, and that's equal to 1 over 2 pi square root of LC. So that's 1 over 2 pi square root of 10 milli henrys times 10 nanofarads. So our resonant frequency is going to be 15.915 kilohertz. XC, we've calculated this before. It's 1 over 2 pi FC. So in this case, it's 1 over 2 pi resonant frequency of 15.915k times 10 nanofarads and that works out to 1k ohms and remember xc is minus 90 degrees xl we've used before that's 2 pi fl or 2 pi times the resonant frequency of 15.915k times the 10 millihenries and that works out to 999.969 ohms, basically 1k ohms. And remember, inductive reactance is at an angle of plus 90 degrees. Then we need to find out what the total resistance of our circuit's going to be. In this case, we need Rg, which is the internal resistance of the function generator, which is about 50 ohms. R coil, which is about 22 ohms, and the resistor we're using. So that's 50 plus 22 plus 470 equals 542 ohms at an angle of 0 degrees. So the Q of our circuit can be either XL or XC over RT, and it's also equal to the resonant frequency divided by the bandwidth, which is F2 minus F1. So for our calculation, we're going to be using XL over RT, which is 1K divided by 542, and that's equal to 1.845. The bandwidth is equal to the resonant frequency divided by the Q. It's also equal to F2 minus F1, but here we're going to use FR divided by Q. So that's 15.915K divided by 1.845, and that works out to a bandwidth of 8.626 kilohertz. So to find F1, or the lower corner frequency, we take the resonant frequency minus the bandwidth divided by 2. In our case, it's 15.915k minus the bandwidth of 8.626k divided by 2, and that works out to 11.602 kilohertz. Our upper corner frequency, or F2, is equal to the resonant frequency plus the bandwidth divided by 2. In this case, it's 15.915k plus 8.626k divided by 2, which works out to 20.228 kilohertz. So our bandwidth covers the ranges from 11.6 kilohertz up to 20.2 kilohertz. And that range is equal to the bandwidth of 8.6 kilohertz. So in table 10.1, I've filled in my resonant frequency as 15.915 kilohertz. Q worked out to 1.845. 
My lower frequency is 11.602 kilohertz. My upper frequency is 20.228 kilohertz. So under procedure, step number two, we're going to build the circuit of figure 10.1 using R is equal to 470 ohms, L is 10 millihenries, and C is 10 nanofarads. We're to place a probe across the resistor and set the output of the generator to one volt peak to peak sine wave. Now this is a small signal, so you may need to pull the amplitude knob on the function generator out to adjust your sine wave to be one volt peak to peak. We're to set the uh, frequency to the theoretical resonant frequency of table 10.1, which is somewhere around 16 kilohertz. Make sure that the bandwidth limit of the oscilloscope is engaged for both channels to reduce the signal noise for more accurate readings. So here is how I built my circuit. Uh, you can see that the red terminal from the function generator and channel 1 of the oscilloscope comes in and goes to the first leg of my capacitor and the capacitor is labeled 103. The second leg of the capacitor is in the same row as the first leg of the inductor and you can see my inductor is labeled 103. The second leg of the inductors in the same row as my uh, resistor, which is 470 ohms. And then the last leg of the resistor goes back to the common of the function generator and the common of channel 1 of the oscilloscope and the common of channel 2 of the oscilloscope. The yellow terminal goes to the red lead of channel 2 of my oscilloscope and it's looking at the voltage across the resistor. So you can see each of my three components is in series. So this is my function generator. I've turned it on. I've set it up for sine wave. The uh, times 10k button is pressed in. The OSC button is in the out position. I've got the uh, dial to adjust my frequencies here, so I'm just going to leave it at about 14.4 kilohertz. This knob here, the sweep knob, must be in the fully off or detent position. This button is pushed in, this button is pushed in, and this button is pulled out. This is your amplitude, and we need one volt peak to peak sine wave on the oscilloscope so you need to pull it out and basically what that does is it makes the waveform smaller and our output of course comes from this end BNC connector and this is the basic setup of my oscilloscope you can see I have the measure button activated so channel 1 is at about 14.4 kilohertz Channel 1, you need to adjust it so it does say 1 volt peak to peak. Uh, channel 2, we're not worried about at the moment. It's going to be slightly less than 1 volt peak to peak, and the other two we're not worried about. You can see I have my uh, volts per division set at about 200 millivolts per division, and my time base or my seconds per division is 10 microseconds per division. So under procedure, step number three, we're to adjust the frequency in small amounts up and down until the maximum voltage is found. Now this is the maximum voltage dropped across the resistor. This is the experimental resonance frequency. We're to record it in table 10.1. Where to note the amplitude, it should be approximately equal to the source voltage of 1 volt peak to peak or less. We're then going to sweep the frequency above and below the resonant frequency until the experimental F1 and F2 are found. These will occur at a voltage amplitude of approximately 0 0.707 times the resonant voltage, i.e. the half power points. 
We're to record these frequencies in table 10.1. Also determine and record the experimental Q based on the experimental resonant frequency F1 and F2. So to find the resonant frequency, I'm going to adjust the large knob on my function generator. And if I rotate it counterclockwise, you can see channel 2 is getting smaller, so that's the wrong way. If I rotate it clockwise, you can see that the waveform gets larger and also becomes in phase with channel 1. So when it's exactly in phase, it'll be at its largest value. And we can see here it's 16.2 kilohertz. It's 840 millivolts. So in table 10.1, resonant frequency FR, experimental, I've recorded as 16.2 kilohertz. Now down here on table 10.2, I've recorded FR as 16.2 kilohertz and VR as 840 millivolts. Now to find F1 and F2, that's going to be approximately 0.707 times the 840 millivolts. So on the side of my page, I've written down 0 0.707 times 840 millivolts. So that should be equal to 594 millivolts. So starting with my circuit in resonance, I'm going to rotate the large knob on my function generator counterclockwise until channel 2 reads somewhere close to 594 millivolts. It's also important to make sure that channel 1 stays at 1 volt peak to peak, so you may need to change it slightly as you make your adjustments. So at 592 millivolts, at 1 volt peak to peak on channel 1, you can see I'm at 12.3 kilohertz. So now I'm going to rotate the large dial on my function generator clockwise until my circuit goes into resonance, and then I'm going to go past it until channel 2 once again reads 594 millivolts. So you can see I'm at about 592 millivolts and my frequency is 21.9 kilohertz. So coming back to table 10.1, I've filled in F1 or the lower corner frequency as 12.3 kilohertz F2, the upper frequency as 21.9 kilohertz, and Q is equal to the resonant frequency divided by the bandwidth. So that's equal to the resonant frequency divided by F2 minus F1. So it's 16.2K divided by 21.9K minus 12.3K. And that worked out to 1.69. So moving on to procedure step number four, which to transcribe the experimental frequencies of table 10.1 to the top three entries of table 10.2. Then for all of the frequencies in table 10.2, we're to measure and record the voltage across the resistor. We're also to measure and record the inductor and capacitor voltages. And it says to note that the inductor and capacitor will have to be swapped with the resistor position in order to maintain proper ground reference with the oscilloscope. So looking back at figure 10.2, the ground references go to the bottom of our resistor, and then channel 2 looked at this point, channel 1 was looking at the output from the function generator. So to look at the voltage across the inductor or the voltage across the capacitor, we'd end up moving the oscilloscope ground to this point, shorting out the other components in our circuit. 
So what we're going to do is swap the resistor with the capacitor and the resistor with the inductor. That way we'll be looking at the voltage across the capacitor or the voltage across the inductor, keeping all the grounds at the same common point. So you can see in table 10.2, I've already recorded my resonant frequency F1 and F2 and the voltage across the resistor at each of those points. Now I'm going to set up my circuit to each of these frequencies and measure each of the remaining voltages to fill in the table. So at 1 kilohertz, the voltage drop across my resistor is 32 millivolts. At 5 kilohertz, the voltage drop across my resistor is 160 millivolts. At 8 kilohertz, the voltage drop across my resistor is 300 millivolts. At 12 kilohertz, the voltage drop across my resistor is 552 millivolts. At 20 kilohertz, the voltage drop across my resistor is 704 millivolts. At 30 kilohertz, the voltage drop across my resistor is 376 millivolts. At 50 kilohertz, the voltage drop across my resistor is 200 millivolts. At 100 kilohertz, the voltage drop across my resistor is 96 millivolts. So in table 10.2, under VR, I've recorded all my voltage drops across the resistor at each of the required frequencies. Now I'm going to swap the capacitor with the resistor so that I can read the voltage reading across the capacitor at all these required frequencies. So this is my original circuit and you can see the black lead that comes from the common of the power supply goes to the resistor and the other side of the resistor goes through the yellow wire to channel 2 of the oscilloscope. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to change places between the resistor and the capacitor. So you can see I've moved my resistor up to where the capacitor was and the capacitor down to where the resistor was. So now channel 2 is looking at the voltage across the capacitor with respect to common, which is the black lead, going back to the common of the uh, function generator. So since I'm already at 100 kilohertz, I'm going to take my readings going backwards. So at 100 kilohertz, I'm at 30 millivolts. At 50 kilohertz, I'm at 130 millivolts. At 30 kilohertz, I'm at 440 millivolts. At 20 kilohertz, I'm at 1.22 volts. At our second corner frequency, F2, I'm at 21.9 kilohertz, and the voltage across the capacitor is 980 millivolts. At our resonant frequency of 16.2 kilohertz, the voltage across my capacitor is 1.86 volts. Now keep in mind, you may have to adjust the amplitude on the function generator to keep channel 1 as close to 1 volt peak to peak as possible. At 12.3 kilohertz, which is F1, the voltage across my capacitor is 1.78 volts. At 12 kilohertz, I'm at 1.68 volts. At 8 kilohertz, the voltage drop across my capacitor is 1.3 volts. At 5 kilohertz, the voltage drop across the capacitor is 1.16 volts. At 1 kilohertz, the voltage drop across the capacitor is 1.06 volts. So on table 10.2, for VC, I've filled in the voltage drops across the capacitor at the required frequencies. Now I'm going to measure the voltage drop across the inductor by swapping the capacitor with the inductor. So this is my circuit. I have the capacitor followed by the inductor followed by the resistor. So now I'm going to replace the capacitor with the inductor. So this is my circuit with the inductor in place of the capacitor. So you can see that channel 2 of the oscilloscope which comes in through this yellow line 
records the voltage across the inductor with respect to the common of the function generator. So since I'm already at 1 kilohertz, I'm going to take the voltage reading across my inductor. Don't worry about the noise that you can see on my channel 2 signal. I'm just going to record that as 11 millivolts. At 5 kilohertz, the voltage drop across my inductor is 116 millivolts. At 8 kilohertz, the voltage drop across the inductor is 308 millivolts. At 12 kilohertz, the voltage drop across the inductor is 920 millivolts. At 12.3 kilohertz, which is F1, or a first corner frequency, I'm going to record that as 1 volt. At resonant frequency of 6.2 kilohertz, the voltage drop across the inductor is 1.92 volts. And remember, you may need to adjust your function generator to make sure that channel 1 is still around 1 volt peak to peak. At 20 kilohertz, the voltage drop across the inductor is 1.9 volts. At 21.9 kilohertz, which is F2, the voltage drop across the inductor is 1.8 volts. At 30 kilohertz, the voltage drop across the inductor is 1.36 volts. At 50 kilohertz, the voltage drop across the inductor is 1.16 volts. At 100 kilohertz, the voltage drop across the inductor is 1.08 volts. I have now completed table 10.2 for the low Q circuit. Under procedure for the low Q, step number five, it says based on the data from table 10.2, plot VR, VC, and VL as a function of frequency on plot 10.1. So on plot 10.1, for the graph of the low Q, I've labeled it VR, VC, VL versus frequency. For the horizontal axes, we're going to be using semi-log graph paper. The logarithmic scale goes up in groups of 10, and we go from 1 kilohertz, 2 kilohertz, 3 kilohertz, up to 10 kilohertz. And as we get closer to 10 kilohertz, the spacing between the lines gets smaller. And then in the next grid, we go from 10 kilohertz to 20 kilohertz. So now we increase by steps of 10. So we go to 30, 40, all the way up to 100 kilohertz at the end. The vertical scale is voltage and it's measured in volts. Each division is going to be about one quarter volt. So half volt, three quarter volt, one volt, one and a half, two volts. The blue line on my graph is VR, and you'll notice that resonant frequency, my VR is close to 875 millivolts, and remember we're putting in 1 volt uh, peak to peak. You'll notice that VL, which is the yellow line, is actually larger than the 1 volt peak to peak that we're putting in. And at high frequency, VL drops the entire 1 volt. At lower frequency, VL drops hardly any voltage. VC, which is my green line, you'll notice at low frequency it drops the entire 1 volt. Remember, a capacitor is two plates separated by a space. So we'd expect to see the entire one volt dropped. As we get to higher frequencies, the voltage drop across our capacitor is a lot lower because at higher frequencies, a capacitor acts as a short circuit. You'll notice the total voltage at resonance seems to approach two volts for VL and VC. That's because VL and VC are at a phase angle that cancel each other out. 
So you're just left with the current flowing through R. That same current flowing through R has to flow through XC and XL, producing a higher voltage drop. Moving on to the high Q circuit under procedure, step number six, we're to change R to 47 ohms and repeat steps one through five, but using tables 10.3 and 10.4 for the high Q circuit. For our high Q circuit, we're replacing the 470 ohm resistor with the 47 ohm resistor all our other components remain the same. So our resonant frequency does not use resistor value, so it's going to remain at 15.915 kilohertz. XC doesn't refer to resistance, so it remains at one kilo ohm at minus 90 degrees. XL, I've rounded up to one kilohertz at plus 90 degrees. RT is now equal to 50 plus 22 plus the 47 ohm resistor and that works out to 119 ohms at an angle of zero degrees. So now our Q defined as XL divided by RT is now 1K divided by 119 and that works out to 8.403. So for our bandwidth calculation, we take the resonant frequency of 15.915K, divide it by the Q of 8.403, and that works out to 1.894 kilohertz. So now you can see the bandwidth is a lot narrower. F1, our lower corner frequency, is 15.915 kilohertz minus 1.894 divided by 2 so that works out to 14.968 kilohertz and F2 which is our upper corner frequency is 15.915 K plus 1.894 K divided by 2 and that works out to 16.862 kilohertz so you can see our range is now from 14.9 kilohertz to 16.8 kilohertz representing a bandwidth of approximately 1.9 kilohertz. So now on table 10.3 I've filled in my resonant frequency as 15.915 kilohertz my Q is 8.403 my lower corner frequency is 14.968 kilohertz and my upper corner frequency is 16.862 kilohertz. I've now rebuilt my circuit and have inserted a 47 ohm resistor. Notice one leg goes to ground, the other leg goes to the inductor and at that midpoint I have it going to channel 2 of the oscilloscope. So channel 2 of the oscilloscope is looking at the voltage drop across my 47 ohm resistor going back to the common of the function generator. I've adjusted my function generator until the two waveforms are in phase and channel 2 is at its maximum and you can see in my case that is 15.8 kilohertz and channel 2 is 352 millivolts. Make absolutely sure that you do adjust channel 1 for 1 volt peak to peak. To find F1 and F2, you'll have to take your maximum voltage drop at resonance, multiply it by 0.707, and adjust your function generator until your output on channel 2 is approximately 249 millivolts, based on what your maximum voltage was at resonance. Make sure that channel 1 stays at 1 volt. You will have to adjust it as you change your frequency. And you can see that my F1 is at 14.73 kilohertz. And channel 2 is approximately 248 millivolts. For F2, 
you can see my VR is 248 millivolts and that's at about 16.88 kilohertz. So in table 10.4 I've recorded FR as 15.8 kilohertz at 352 millivolts. F1 is 14.73 kilohertz at 248 millivolts and F2 at 16.88 kilohertz at 248 millivolts. So on table 10.4 I've gone ahead and taken my readings at 1 kilohertz, 5 kilohertz, 8 kilohertz, 12, 20, 30, 50, and 100 kilohertz. Remember to keep adjusting your amplitude on your function generator to make sure that channel 1 does stay at 1 volt peak to peak. Now to fill in my column for VC, I've switched my resistor and my capacitor. So now channel 2 is looking at the voltage across the capacitor with respect to the common of the function generator. So on table 10.4, I've gone ahead and recorded VC at my resonant F1, F2, 1 kilohertz, 5 kilohertz, 8, 12, 20, 30, 50, and 100 kilohertz. You'll notice the maximum voltage at resonance is 7.68 volts. So you will need to adjust your input from your function generator to make sure that channel 1 stays at 1 volt peak to peak as you're taking all your readings for VC on channel 2. To fill in table 10.4 for VL, I've replaced the capacitor with the inductor. Remember it's a series circuit so it doesn't matter what order these go into, but now channel 2 is looking at the voltage across the inductor with respect to the common of the function generator. So in table 10.4 I've recorded my experimental VL readings at frequency, the lower edge or corner frequency, the upper edge or F2, 1 kilohertz, 5 kilohertz, 8, 12, 20, 30, 50, and 100 kilohertz. Remember to make sure that you do keep your function generator outputting 1 volt peak to peak because it will change as the current changes coming out of the function generator. So going back to table 10.3, I've filled in my experimental resonant frequency is 15.8 kilohertz, F1 experimental 14.73 kilohertz, F2 experimental 16.88 kilohertz. To calculate Q, Q is equal to F at resonance divided by the bandwidth, which is equal to FR divided by F2 minus F1. So 15.8 kilohertz divided by 16.88 kilohertz minus 14.73 kilohertz. And that worked out to 7.63. I'm going to leave you to calculate the percent deviation. So for the high Q circuit under procedure step number seven, it says based on the data from table 10.4, plot VR, VC, and VL as a function of frequency on plot 10.2. So on plot 10.2, I've labeled the horizontal axes as frequency in kilohertz. And once again, we're going to be using semi-log graph paper. So we start at one end at 1 kilohertz. And by the middle of the graph, we get to 10 kilohertz, then 20, 30, all the way down to 100 kilohertz. I've labeled my graph for the high Q circuit as VR, VC, and VL versus frequency. The vertical axis is labeled as voltage and it's measured in volts. And you can see in this case we have to go all the way up to 8 volts. So each major division is 1 volt. So I've drawn in my graph. Uh, I've used the points as close as possible to my measured values. Uh, VR is in blue. 
VL is in yellow and VC is in green. One thing I want you to notice on this graph is that uh, VR only seems to get up to, well, not even quite half a volt. Now, if we're applying one volt to the circuit, and VL and VC are supposed to cancel each other out, why is the voltage drop across VR so small? So when you look at our circuit of figure 10.1, in the first circuit, where we had a low Q circuit, we were using a resistor value of 470 ohms. You have to remember that the internal or DC resistance of our inductor is 22 ohms. Comparing that to 470 ohms, it was almost insignificant. When we're working with the high Q circuit, our resistor value is now 47 ohms. And when you compare 47 ohms to the approximate 22 ohms of the coil, you can see that it is now fairly significant. So we set up our function generator to have 1 volt peak to peak coming in. The voltage drop across our 47 ohm resistor will be proportional to the 47 plus the 22 ohms. So if you take 47, over 47 plus 22 times 1 volt, that's going to be significantly lower than the 1 volt peak to peak coming in. So that helps explain why VR is significantly lower than the 1 volt that we expected to have dropped across it. There's one other minor observation you might have made and that's the maximum voltage for VC and the maximum voltage for VL does not occur at exactly the resonant frequency. So VC maximum occurs just before resonance and VL maximum will occur just after resonance. There are mathematical calculations involved in determining exactly where that is but for today's lab, we're just going to take our measurements at resonance. So on the last page of the lab, I've left you three questions to answer based on your calculations, observations, and conclusions. When you've completed your lab, show it to your instructor so they can initial it to indicate that it is complete. <laughs>